Uh, my name is Kenny Shea Dinkin, and I head up creative for Play First. Play First is a uh, casual games publisher, uh, best known for games like Diner Dash and Wedding Dash and Cooking Dash and Dream Chronicles and Chocolatier. And we've had a lot of success making games that sort of have an emotional engagement with the player. And we've done most of that around narrative and storytelling. Uh, but what I argued today uh, is, um, and I, I sort of did it by asking people if they want to change the world or save the world, uh, is, um, is that you know, video game making, video game design is still a young art form. And we still have a lot to figure out about actually telling a good story uh, and figuring out the way that narrative and engaging narrative can be interpolated into a, a nonlinear emergent system where a player has choice or agency. Um, and uh, I talked about uh, some of the ways in which we've tried to do this that has sort of mm, been less than perfectly successful, either through kind of thematic choices that were kind of odd or just targeted at kind of a male hardcore gamer, or bad writing, or writing that breaks the fourth wall that talks directly at the player and says, hello, player, click here, drag there. Um, and there are examples, I think, more recently of some really ambitious and wonderful narrative approaches in game design. I, I cited Bioshock, and there's a few others that I think are really groundbreaking and remarkable. But what we're not seeing as much of, right, is, is really a natural way that narrative gets, um, emerges from gameplay in a really uh, seamlessly integrated way. Typically, they're sort of stapled on, and you can really see the staples either in cutscenes or or comics, and then even in those cases, we don't always have the best writers. We let technologists do the writing. Games tend to be about dragons and spaceships and naked elves and bikinis, and not so much about mass market themes, which is ironic because mass, if you really want to unlock the mass market, that's a lot of women, um, you know, maybe we need to take a look at, at uh, story, which is such a huge, powerful way to kind of bring people in, especially in the, in the business models we're seeing currently around casual games, the, the try before you buy one hour free trial, or, or frankly in social games, the notion of retention. Uh, I, I tried to cite that we've had, um, uh, among our fan base and our sort of irrational loyalty around uh, Flow from Diner Dash. People love Flow, it was an amazing success. We've been able to build uh, a lot of games, a whole story world around uh, Flow and uh, Diner Dash. And what I sort of maintained in the talk, right, is that by having a good character and a good story, you create this emotional connection the player and that leads to this irrational loyalty which can lead to things like lots of money or sales or a broader uh, portfolio of games within that story world. So I, mean, I don't know where we're going but um, I, I, would, I would encourage people to think about the idea that story has to be linear and challenge that. I did talk a little bit about dance and Native American storytelling or oral history and the Bible and sort of alternate ways to tell stories that other art forms have struggled with. I didn't talk a lot about in this talk, I've talked about it, in other talks, is musical theater, which had a similar problem 100 years ago. They, they could not tell a story in a musical theater piece. Um, you'd have a story, and then everything would stop. You'd have a song and dance, and you'd go back to the story, and it would feel very stapled together. And then, uh, um, I guess it was 1927, um, uh, Showboat had Old Man River, uh, which was this watershed. It was like a song that told the story and moved the story forward. And of course, today, you know, the, the, the Broadway show is a huge mass market entertainment phenomenon and everyone expects that the songs will tell the story. We just know that's part of the art form, but it actually was not a no-brainer uh, when the medium was first evolving and sort of stepping its stones from, you know, opera to operetta to vaudeville and ultimately uh, to the modern day Broadway musical. And I think we're going through some of those growing pains now in, in possibly a more complex or harder to disentangle or less intuitive way because of all the nonlinear elements of choice that are involved in game, but also kind of really more intellectually amazing and challenging and interesting. Um, and yeah, you know, adventure games, what I talked about today, more often than not do lean on a sort of linear narrative that's embedded and, and it's a more natural fit, right, than, I don't know, maybe a shooter. Um, although, I mean, Bioshock, I think I mentioned that earlier, is an amazing job of creating a narrative world around uh, games like that. So, I, you know, I don't know what the future is. Um, I just encourage people to keep trying and to try new things and to not get locked into assumptions um, and uh, to invite the storyteller into the world of game making um, and not push them out. Uh, to try to imagine a world where game designers aren't just um, uh, math 
system and technology people, but they're all kinds of people, including the storytellers, the artists, um, and, the, and the technologists. I think the obvious reason there is because they've done the best job at targeting the non-gamer market, the mass market. A gamer, I think, will be more forgiving about uh, less than optimal storytelling because they're really not in it for the story and they don't need to be in it for the story. They love the gameplay and they're drinking down the gameplay, right? But if you're trying to capture a mass market and you want to get them emotionally engaged, you know, there's been a lot of evidence, right, that a narrative uh, rapper can be a great way to um, capture the mass market. Yeah, the evidence is in television and film and comic books and novels and plays and et cetera. Um, and so you know, one theory holds that if you want to try to unlock the mass market, which is sort of the promise of casual games and something that actually we're seeing in many ways in social games, uh, that narrative ought to be a really powerful way to do that kind of unlocking and ultimately retain people.